Jobs numbers may have come in weaker than expected, and some consumer spending may be softening. But overall, the economy remains strong and inflation is moderating. We talked with Harvard economics professor Greg Mankiw at the Aspen Economic Strategy Group meetings about how the Fed is doing and what comes next. I think we're there. I think I, I give the Fed low marks early on because I thought they were slow off the mark. But then they rea once they realized the problem, they reacted vigorously. And I think we're basically cl very close to target now. And if you look at the, the uh, measures of inflation, a big part of that is shelter. And shelter, we know, is measured with a lag. If you look at the private sector measures of shelter inflation, rents are basically flat now. There's no inflation in that. So I think the overall measured inflation rates, like the CPI say, that's going to be coming down to target in the next six months. So the economy is doing well by most measures. Uh, a lot of people want to move to our country. A lot right. of people want to invest in our country. And yet a lot of people are very unhappy with the economy. How do you square those two things? Well, the pandemic had a strange effect on people's finances because if you think back to the early pandemic, we were sending people lots of checks, whether it's just general stimulus checks or expanded unemployment insurance. And so people were getting lots of income, but they couldn't spend it. So they were saving a lot. They were paying back down their credit card bills. Uh, so even though people were kind of unhappy being stuck up in their houses, their finances were pretty good. So if you look at where we are now, all the stimulus checks have disappeared. People are, are spending more, and so their credit cards balances are building up. Credit card delinquencies are rising a little bit. So I think if you're comparing where we were to 2020, well, we're better off because we're not in a pandemic, but people's finances are actually slightly worse. There's a lot of talk about when the Fed will cut, how much it will cut. Put that to one side. Where do you think we will end up? where we end up through this cycle, because there's a debate, really, on whether we're going to go back down to really low interest rates or whether there are structural factors that will keep them elevated. I don't think we know, and I think the Fed is going to have to play it by ear. Um, I, think, I think there were good reasons why we had a 30-year decline in real interest rates um, prior to the pandemic and the recent, recent events. Um, to what extent are those forces still in play, and to what extent are there new forces, like very big budget deficits that are going to keep interest rates high? I don't think we really know yet. Partly it's going to depend on future policy. I mean, the next president's going to have to make decisions over taxes and spending. Uh, and so I don't think we really know where the Fed's going to end up. It's probably lower than it is today, but probably higher than it was before the, the, the hiking cycle began. You mentioned the debt and the deficit. Uh, how big a problem is that for the economy? Well, I think it, there's two problems with the debt. I think there's sort of the um, ordinary problems and the extraordinary problems. The ordinary problems are basically passing a debt onto our children. You can't leave your children a negative bequest unless you're doing it through the government. And that's what we're basically doing is we're leaving our children a negative bequest by running up the debt. So they're going to face higher taxes. that will encourage some crowding out of private capital, reduce productivity growth. And then there's the extraordinary problems of debt. You know, could the United States turn into uh, Greece or Argentina, where there's a fiscal crisis. The markets don't think there's going to be one. They're expecting us to be responsible, and I hope they're right. But, it's, but the laws of economics that played out in Greece and Argentina could happen in the United States. And so I think we need to, at some point, move to a sustainable fiscal policy. Even short of Greece or Argentina, at some point, uh, does the, uh, the deficit problem curtail the Fed's ability actually to control the economy? Because at some point, the markets take over in setting rates from the Fed. Well, the Fed would have to set higher rates. I think that I'm not really worried about the Fed losing control, short of a fiscal crisis. I'm not worried about the Fed losing control of the economy. But it doesn't mean the Fed is going to have to um, place higher rates. And that could be a problem for fiscal policy, because higher rates put pressure on the budget deficit. Uh, and as a result, the, the tension between fiscal policymakers and monetary policymakers could be exacerbated. Uh, however we define debt crisis, what are the prospects for the next president, whoever it is, will have to deal with the debt crisis? And I guess that really is bond vigilantes, right? Well, it is, exactly. It's bond, bond, bond vigilantes. And I don't think we know. It's probably psychological. At what point do people become scared? I, I don't think it's going to happen soon. But I think at some point in, in, in our lifetimes, the current policy has to be changed. Because if you look at the CBO projections on their current policy, debt to GDP ratio is going up to infinity. And we know that's not going to happen. So some, at some point, that's going, to, that's going to change. It's probably not going to change in the next few years, but it's something we're going to have to deal with. And how to deal with it is not be an easy political problem. Uh, what about the election coming up? Uh, insofar as we know anything, we have, I think, a sense maybe of where uh, second President Trump would take us. I don't know how much we know about Kamala Harris. But what are the alternatives as you see them? Well, one of the big issues for me is the role of the United States in the global economy. Um, I, am, I know it's a, sort of a bad word these days, but I'm a globalist. I actually believe that uh, integ integrating the United States with the global economy is a good thing. So I'm in favor of free trade agreements. 
I'm in favor of more relaxed immigration rules. Th this was a sort of a mainstream view back in the Bush and Clinton years. Now it's, there's a sort of a backlash against it. I think that backlash has been is ill-informed. And I think at some point we need to go back to being a leader in the global economy, which I think is good not only for the rest of the world, but also for the United States. Uh, what about U.S. relations with China when it comes to the economy? Well, China is the big challenge, uh, not, not so much economically, but I think politically, and especially the, the threat in Taiwan. So I, I, I do worry a lot about sort of what's going on in that part of the world. Uh, I, understand, I don't really like industrial policy in general, but I understand the motivation behind the CHIPS Act because almost all the high-end chips are coming from Taiwan Semiconductor, and that's a very vulnerable part of the world. So, uh, yeah, our, our relationship with China, China is very important, but it's not so much an economic relationship as a geopolitical relationship, and that's the part we need to negotiate.